Hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, this is O-Culture, where we vulture your ear space and mindfuck your headspace with esoteric vibrations and mystical thoughtscapes. I am Ryan Peverly, your party host, the fool you are journeying with on this arcane voyage. As always, we're transmitting this episode to you at 528 hertz, the miracle tone, the frequency of love. Do you feel it? That's a straight-up violation of your heart chakra. But don't you dare pull back from it, cozy up to those earbuds, and let these sweet sounds seduce you into a state of nirvana. And no, I'm not talking about that in utero nirvana, but I am talking about opening up that heart-shaped box, prying open that third eye, and birthing new thought forms into your field of vision, you powerful creator, you... And what better way to do that than with our guest tonight? She's the oracle of the metaphorical, the alphabet alchemist, the sorceress of the thesaurus, the metaphysical mother goose. She is Laurel Erica, and she's a cunning linguist, (laughs) and she is a living, breathing personification of a wordsmith. Laurel has a master's degree in spiritual psychology and has worked as an intuitive counselor. She's now an editor who helps writers better use imagery and metaphor to help elevate their frequency of consciousness in their work, combining her natural and learned abilities to help them express themselves in language that is true to their nature and communicates their message in ways that resonate with the heart minds of their audience. Laurel also has a performance project called Word Magic, where she performs stunning stunts of cunning punning and vibrant verse and spontaneous spellbinding speech that will T-R-A-N-C-E form the way you view the W-H-I-R-L-E-D forever. Laurel and I had a hell of a lot of fun talking about the magic and power of language, conscious thought and creation, casting spells with words, poetry as a form of alchemy, recreating the world with the word, Donald Trump's degradation of language, and much, much more. So let's flip this script from prologue to dialogue and cast this pod off into that extra dimensional ether. Enjoy! Laurel Erica, thanks so much for being here. Grateful you found me. Thank you. Yeah, I found you uh, quite a while ago, actually. You gave this talk in Malibu a few years back. It was based around nine obscure words that reveal the whole purpose of life. Right. I don't want to revisit that entire talk, but I do want you to tell the listeners just right up front here about my favorite word of the nine, and that was theodicy. Oh, isn't that a good one? I love that word. Could you explain what that means or spell it and then explain what it means? Sure. Um, Well, first, I'll explain how I discovered it. I was planning to write a poem honoring somebody and honoring the odyssey of his life. And I was looking for a rhyme for the odyssey. So I was going the odyssey, the odyssey, the odyssey, the odyssey, the odyssey. That has to be a word. And I looked it up and it is. It's spelled T-H-E-O-D-I-C-Y. And the definition that I found for it was a vindication of the goodness of God in relation to the existence of evil. So I interpreted that to mean that the odyssey that all of us undertake when we incarnate is to move through life and face challenges that feel so much bigger than we are, and yet to be compelled to draw upon a resource within us that enables us to transcend it and discover that we are more than anything the world can throw at us. And there's a a phrase in the Bible about overcoming the world. And I I met someone I could talk about who, in my life, was the absolute star of overcoming the world. But that, in any case, is my understanding of the word theodicy. I think theologians use it to justify the fact that there is so much negativity and horror in the world. And people ask, how can there be a God? And yet this is allowed. And so I believe theodicy is the is the heading for the argument that ensues around that point. But for me, it's about us discovering that we are divine and that there is within us something greater than anything that life could throw at us. But it It's only because we are up against such extreme challenges that we have the opportunity to discover that that's true. Quite the word to just discover on a whim there, but 
I was really impressed by that. Do you have a favorite word of those nine words that you presented a few years ago? I think I have a lot of favorite words, but of those, I would say the word omnificent. And many people know omniscient, which means all-knowing, and omnipotent, which means all-powerful, and omnipresent, meaning present everywhere. And these are descriptions of the divine. But I've never met anyone who knew, knew the word omnificent, O-M-N-I-F-I-C-E-N-T, which means possessing full creative power. And yet, this is something that applies to us. And people, and not simply to a divinity well beyond us. And so I meet people who don't believe they're creative at all, or that they're filled with unlimited creative power, yet the human species has already demonstrated that we are possessed with full destructive power. So the opposite has to be true. Yeah, I find myself in a place in my life where the people that I am surrounded by, friends and family, I'm always urging them to create things. I don't know why, I don't know where that that started for me, but the older I've gotten, the more that I've realized that it is important to create things. Maybe you have a better understanding of that, you know, through language or, you know, just your own personal travels. But why is creating things so important? Because I can't, I can't put it into words right now, and you're better at words anyways. So why is creating things so important? Well, I, I can explain why it is for me in, in a very uh, brief statement. I Years ago, in 05 actually, I wrote um, a book called We Do Come With Instructions. And one of, and it's um, the ABCs of self-realization. And um, it's a book of philosophy through wordplay. It's not published. But my little riff on creation is that the creator creates, and when we create, we feel divine. And that, for me, is the essence of, of the compulsion to be creative, is that it puts me on a different frequency where I am open and receptive to higher creative energies. And, and it, it takes moving the inner critic out of the way, of course, because we have that very self-limiting negative voice inside. But once you get in a groove with the art and, and you, you work your way through that negative voice, and allow something new to flow through you, you do feel divine. And and you contribute something to the culture. It may be it may not be your artwork or your music. It may be the the harmony that you get into as a result of being creative. But it can be that and more. So that's my take on it. Well, that's my take too. I'm just gonna steal that explanation and use it as my own from now on because that's please that's perfect. do. That's perfect. Yeah. So let's take a step back and let's talk about who you are and how you got to be who and what you are right now. Because my audience probably doesn't know who Laurel Erica is, but I want them to. Where did this journey begin for you in your life? And how did you stumble upon this gift for language that you have? Well, thank you for asking. I remember saying at the age of three or four to my parents, I bet I now know all the words in the English language. And um, my mother said, I bet you don't, and spoke a word I hadn't heard. And I said, well, what language was that? Because I was so convinced. And I'll, uh, in a moment, I'll tell you where I think that came from. But in any case, I had, um, on my hero's journey, there was a call to the journey, and it came from a bat. And the way that happened was that uh, metaphorically and literally, my father was um, taking delivery of a sound system, a Magnavox monaural sound system. And the man who was delivering and unpacking and setting it up 
said to me, who again was probably three or four, um, and, and came over to see what he was doing. And he told me that when he'd opened the packing box, that a bat had flown out of the box and landed in the tree in the backyard. And where we lived in a desert town in Southern California, there weren't a whole lot of trees. But I remember standing in front of them as this little toddler expecting to see a bat hanging from the tree. And it was a baseball bat that I was expecting to see. And so in my memory of that incident, it was the first time I discovered that unrelated words might have the same name. And that was a very curious thing to me. And it, it initiated my fascination and focus on words. And so I, I began exploring them. And my father, who would do, he was an artist, and he'd make his own frames. And he had a, a level to do for cutting the wood and making sure it was straight. And I was fascinated by this level with the bubble in the middle. And at one point, I discovered that level was a level word. It's a palindrome. It's the same front and back. And it's L-E-V-E-L, both ways. And, and later, I discovered that opposite begins with opposites, O-P-P-O, and parallel has three parallel lines. And so I just was off and running. And sometimes when I'm presenting, I ask if anyone else as a child tried to dig their way to China, a hole in the backyard. And, you know, lots of people raised their hands. And I ask then if how many people succeeded and only a, a comedian or two will raise their hand at that point. Yeah. But I explained that I actually did succeed and I followed that back through what a friend of mine called echolocution through the English language. I tunneled through the English language and it actually did take me to China. And the way that happened was that I was uh, many, many years later, I was at the Pacific Asia Museum. I saw a bat puppet was thinking of buying it for the uh, uh, use with some school children I was going to be teaching word magic to. And then I walked through the exhibit and I found a little card that said that in Taoist philosophy, the bat is a symbol of happiness because the uh, happiness in Chinese is pronounced fu and bat is also pronounced fu. And playing with words was my happiness. I had a really, I don't know how to describe my childhood, uh, kind of sort of a, a, a quadruplicitous mind fuck was one description that came to me. And I think it set me off looking at the mind fuck in the language and playing with words made me happy. And when I went to China, I learned that Buddha is also, it's like fu. So I have a, this bat puppet that I call Fu, the Buddha bat of happiness. I do practice Buddhism. So um, that's how I started. And I, I just made some fascinating discoveries. And I continue to be fascinated by words and their creative and destructive potential, particularly as we see the misuse of language by the newest Oval Office occupant. Yeah, and uh, we'll get to that a little later in the conversation, but I want to stay with you and your career for just a moment. If I go to your website, I see this phrase, using the word for the world's recreation. What do you mean by that exactly? Well, all the Genesis myths of just about every culture, not just uh, the Judeo-Christian culture, but the Mayan and the Hindu, they all say it began with the word. So the idea of a vibration uttered by a powerful consciousness bringing creation into existence, we all have that as a foundational belief. And yet we basically forget the power of words and we shoot off our mouths, so to speak. We use words very casually and often very cruelly without recognizing what is the power we're unleashing when we do so. So 
using the word for the world's recreation is a recognition of the fact that we as speakers of the word with the power to name and with the consciousness that we can continue to evolve um, have the power to make a significant positive difference in our lives and in our world through the words we choose to use. And when I was a teenager, I was looking at the word word and I, I wrote it out and then I inserted the word, the letter L. And I saw that with one letter, I had turned the word into the world. And I also saw that world could be spelled W-H-I-R-L-E-D, the spinning motion of the globe. And then I, I took the word God, if the word is God, and I inserted the letter L and I saw that God turned into gold. So from this, I concluded that for many people, gold is God on earth. And I I describe gold as fool's God Mm -hmm. and that the letter L may well represent God in the alphabet in its transformative power with words. And so this started me looking at the alphabet as well. And so playing with words, one of my taglines is playing with words leads to entertaining ideas. There's no end to what you can discover and what becomes illumined when you start playing with words. So using the word for the world recreation is both about uh, recreation and wordplay has been Um, a source of recreation for cultures throughout the ages, but also the fact that with all our efforts to heal our psyches and raise consciousness on the planet, we've all but overlooked the very instrument of conscious thought and creation. And yet our forked tongue English language which is the leading source, the leading uh, software of the Western mind, is itself in great need of retuning. That there are things that are misnamed, and as a result of that, it's almost like magnetic weights that that are misaligned and that cause us collectively to create a vision of reality that derives from, I believe, from the time when English was a molten stream of many consciousnesses flowing into the same pot. And the dominant influence at the time was the church. So the idea of a a universe divided by irreconcilably conflicting male superpowers, God and the devil, and the misery of life, the fallen state of humanity, and the inferiority of women, I I can show you where that is located in various words. And so as speakers of the word, if we look at language as software, we get the recognition that software can be upgraded, and we can do that collectively, creatively, consciously together. Is that where word magic came from? Well, word magic came from this whole lifelong exploration of words. And in the 80s, I wrote a a manuscript called Psychosemantics, English in Translation, spelling that T-R-A-N-C-E, with the idea that words can uh, put us in a trance and cast their spells upon our consciousness. So I took it to an editor at a publishing house. He told me that without a PhD, I might as well just forget it. And um, I I wasn't going to go through that process. And a few years later at the, if you know of Reverend Dr. Michael Beckwith of the Agape International Spiritual Center in Culver City, I was a student of his and also an editor for him. And we were asked in one of the classes I took to do a creative expression of what this closer walk with God meant to us. So I wrote a poem for the first time in many years. I didn't think it was very good, but um, I did share it somewhere. And the president of a new age record label contacted me after he had been there and he asked if I wanted to do an album of my verse. So he subsequently gave me $10,000 and I turned everything that I'd learned about language 
into performance art. And that's where word magic came from. And I figured this way I could bypass the academic linguists and just share these ideas directly with people who can make good use of them. So that's the source of word magic. And a friend of mine said, congratulations on creating your own niche. And I thought, well, what's my niche? And then I instantly heard in my head, I'm the metaphysical mother goose. So that's (laughs) the origins of word magic. Yeah, you have some other cool phrases to describe yourself. The alphabet alchemist, the oracle of the metaphorical. I love that one because of the rhyme and then fits well together obviously the sorceress of the thesaurus so yeah you've definitely carved out a niche for yourself and you know speaking of word magic you know that's your performance art well let's talk about word space magic you know one of the more obvious correlations words and language itself has to magic lies in the word that defines how we form words and that is the word spell or spelling So as we speak and write, we are casting spells with our words. And I've seen, I've seen a quote attributed to the Egyptian deity Thoth. Have you seen, do you know Thoth or Thoth? Yes. I'm not Uh sure how Uh you pronounce that, but I've seen a quote from him, I guess. I don't know if it's a him or a her or a thing, but I've seen a quote from Thoth that says that the original purpose of words was for magic spelling to cast magical spells, to cast magic energy with a definite purpose. Do you see words and language in this magical way as spellcasters? Yeah, this is, you brought up just the right thing for me to share something with you that relates to my belief at the age of three or four that I now knew all the words in the English language. I do believe we are essentially casting spells with words and not necessarily consciously, usually unconsciously. So I wrote what I call my theriography, which is about an elemental being who goes through the looking glass into this dimension and has to deconstruct the language to find her way back home again. So I wanted a wish-granting poem that would have all this flutter of magical syllables like bippity boppity boo but I wanted them all to make sense so when I was writing it the first two stanzas came out immediately and I'd I'd like to share them with you because then it'll set up what I want to explain next Um, so it goes this way with cryptic cabalistic tricks I fix elixirs that equips linguistic mixtures to transfix. As fertile verbal herbalist and hypnotist of gibberish, I stir within my crucible all elements reducible to simple symbols that eclipse the prospects for apocalypse. So when that came out, I I looked at it and I thought, prospects for apocalypse, what is that doing in my poem? And then years later, I happened upon a passage in a book that I'd like to just read to you, if I may. The book is called Healing Mantras, and it's by Thomas Ashley Farrand, F-A-R-R-E-N-D. And he writes that during the 16th century, when Elizabeth first ruled England, the most learned man in the realm was a Cambridge educated scholar, John Dee. Not simply an academic, Dee was a student of the mystical arts, including alchemy and astrology. He studied the effects of music, rhythm, and spoken word on human consciousness and believed, as did some of the most gifted poets, that sounds could be used to heal some of the most intense political antagonisms of their time. So uh, the passage goes on to say that language and music are still associated with incantations, spells, and the conjuring of spirits. Poetry, which was already recited or sung to musical accompaniment, was not just an artistic diversion. Like prayers, it was considered by Dee and his circle to be a way of invoking magical powers. If the proper words were associated with the appropriate music, a purifying effect would occur in the minds and hearts of listeners, and political and religious hatreds would be set aside." Working in secret with a cabal of artistic poets in both England and France, John Dee developed 
measured poetic rhythms that were intended to bring about world peace. So when I read that, I thought I must have been among those poets. And that's probably why I thought I knew all the words in English. And so that that also, I mean, explains word magic and and its purpose and and using the word for the world's recreation. And I came upon, um, I have a, I'm a writer, editor, I, I work for other people, usually people dealing with consciousness and healing in their books and art and the environment. And on my website, laurelerica.com, it may be on the first page of that website, I'll have to go take a look. There's a Japanese word called kotodama. Yeah, it's right on your homepage, yeah. Yeah, and it's such a beautiful word. And when I found it, and, and the paragraph that I quote on my home page, um, I had no idea that other people looked at words as I do. Uh, for instance, when I was learning the alphabet, I thought elemento was one single letter. And I know I'm not the only one. And then as an adult, I realized it is. It's elemental. And so I have looked at at words as elemental ent- entities and energies that deserve our reverence and our respect. And so when I'm editing for people, that's a, a big focus for me of, of, as it says in this quote, taking care uh, about the place you give the words to live in the whole composition, because I'm, I'm quite convinced that it can have an uplifting effect on people's consciousness, like a, like a beautiful piece of music. That's a great explanation, yeah. So Kododama means literally what exactly? I believe it means word spirit. Word spirit? Okay. Word spirit. So words have spirits. Do words also have vibrations as they physically come out of my mouth? Does that make sense? Like when, yes, of when, course. when that sound exits by my lips, it's creating a, a vibratory state in yes. the air, right? Yes. Okay. It is. Do you know and... how that, how that works? Like how that affects people or how it affects the environment or anything like that? I, let me see what I can refer to for that. Did you see Masaru Emoto's Messages from Water, this Japanese? I've seen that, actually. I'm really into, this is just a side note, but recently in my life, I have been reading a lot about water having memory and its, its own <clears throat> spirit, its own consciousness, and the same thing with plants as well. I've been reading a lot about that the past probably six months of my life. So it's, it's interesting that you bring that up. Well, I hope that you will um, let me know and your listeners know what books you're reading, because that sounds very, very interesting. And, and just parenthetically, I've just resumed doing intuitive readings using plants as my divinatory instrument. And I did quite a bit of that in the 90s. I worked at a psychic hotline and I would I would watch the movement of the trees in the wind uh, and even got good enough to be able to use with at this to be able to use um, potted plants to get information for people about themselves, about their own nature. So I can mention um, Masaru Emoto's work about how people's consciousness or even just written words taped on pre-tested bottles of distilled water after they're frozen, the crystal that appears reflects the content of the words, positive or negative. There's also the science of cymatics, and you know of that. Yeah, so yeah, the sand yeah. or salt or flour on a resonating um, surface and using a bow or something and how the sound creates patterns, beautiful patterns. And I want to quote to you, Wayne Dyer wrote that sound is the intermediary between the abstract idea and the concrete form of the material world. Sounds literally mold the abstract world of thought and spirit into shapes. And I learned when I was looking uh, at cymatics a number of years ago that one of the early researchers about the impact of sound on substances was Galileo. Really? Yeah. I looked for that reference recently. 
because I had found it online and I, I didn't find it again, but I, I do remember that distinctly. Have you heard of parasymatics? I haven't. What is that? Is that um, using your mind to influence? Yeah, it's sort of like creating magical sigils with water and sound vibration to, you know, kind of create thought forms or tulpas or paranormal activity of some sort. Wow. It's very, it's very new to me. I just stumbled across this uh, on another podcast or a blog or somewhere not too long ago, and I jotted down the term because obviously it was pretty intriguing to me, parasymatics. I knew what cymatics was. I only did a little reading about it, and there's this one, one guy out there, and I can't remember his name. He's doing some experiments with this parasymatics stuff, and it's it's pretty interesting. He's He's essentially trying to create you know, some sort of thought form or paranormal activity through water and sound vibrations. So science just gets weirder and weirder, doesn't it? It really does. And, you know, it's fun to, to explore all of that. And I just, I just Googled it. Yeah. The fellow seems to be Joshua P. Warren. That's who it is. Yep. That's exactly who it was. So I'll, I'll go take a look at that too. But What this far out science may validate is we can feel so impotent when it comes to the world situation. And yet, if, if indeed it all starts with the word, this has been our articles of faith that we were raised with in every culture, wouldn't this be the appropriate time to see what we might be able to do by learning from words and letters, exploring them, and being very conscious in our speaking, conscious and creative of how we are impacting our listeners. And it seems to me this would be the right time. So my sense, like I look at anagrams too, and and the fact that earth and heart are the same word, they're different, where only by the placement of the letter H And I once asked a group of children what they thought the significance of that might be. And one little boy said, maybe it means that the earth is the heart of the solar system. And, you know, that's such a a beautiful reflection. And one of my taglines is that word magic turns youngsters into punsters and punsters into pundits. You cannot help but become wise when you play with words and you let them reveal themselves to you. So, for instance, I was once walking uh, in a beautiful park over the overlooking the ocean and I said to my invisible friends, give me a new word. And they instantly gave me the definition of beautiful. And it is obvious and so definitive it is be you to full hey i think that was in your tedx talk too if it I was remember correctly. Yes. yeah be yes. you to full so what does that mean exactly then does that mean i should just be the fullest version of myself absolutely okay. that's what it means to me and here is here's a, a quote by a medical doctor srivasan pile And he says, perhaps the greatest sadness that we can burden ourselves with is the vulgarity of mediocrity. For mediocrity is an unnatural and untenable condition. To be mediocre is to deny the essence of the greatest offerings of which you are capable and to collude with the masses that tend to identify with the social ideal of normal. The capacity for greatness that lies in any one of us is a product of the complex flavor of our complete selves. So yes, to be yourself to the fullest. I mean, I have a poem in my book. I have a book and CD for sale. It's called Word Magic, Wordplay That Puts a New Spin on the World. And in it, I have a piece on the letter on the letter I. And, and it points out that Just as we have two eyes on our face, there's two eyes in the alphabet. One is the lowercase I, where the the head is separate from the body. And the other is the uppercase I, where we stand as bridge between heaven and earth. So it's a fun poem about 
that back and forth place. And I know when I am in that place, uh, when I'm fulfilling my capital potential, I don't question who I am. I don't need someone else's validation. I, I'm an embodiment of love and I'm an embodiment of creativity and wisdom comes to me in her intuition and direction. And that is true for all of us. That's who we actually are. And anything less than that, we're, we're operating at, at, you know, just a lower frequency and, and maybe on two cylinders when we could be on 12. So you asked my favorite word from the, the nine that I shared in that TEDx talk. The word that relates to that is um, also an obscure word. More people know it than some of the others that I shared. But it's the word entelechy, and it means an actuality instead of a potentiality. And while we may talk about actualizing our potential, very few people know that there's actually a word for actualized potential, and that's the entelechy. And the entelechy is also the force within us that urges us forward, that sends us on that odyssey in which we have to prove the odyssey, that, that we have to find within ourselves something stronger than the forces of opposition that we're facing. And, and really move to a place of greater power. And the entelechy um, is that energy within us, like uh, uh, similar to whatever it is in the acorn that impels it to burst open and go through all of the, the seasons to be covered with dirt and to go through all of the storms that are necessary to become a towering oak. Wow. I really dig your style, Laurel, to be honest. So I'm, I'm so grateful that, that you're here. But I want to go back to, you know, we talked about word magic. We talked about spell casting with words. I want to go back to just a couple very simple words that have magical meaning to them, magical context. And we'll start with the word right, W-R-I-T-E, which contains the word right, R-I-T-E. And that's a word that relates to, you know, ceremonial magic, ritual magic, incantations and things like that, which we've talked about. It's also a word that's prevalent in, you know, secret societies and esoteric orders and groups like that. And then I also wanted to talk about the word will, W-I-L-L. That has a magical meaning to it. It's most commonly used as a verb, but it's also a noun. Do words have the power to will things into existence from your experience? Well, as Abraham Hicks tells us, we have to be a vibrational match for what we want. So they have power. It depends also on the consciousness behind them, how much power they have. And, and when we think about curses, can we curse somebody? And it depends on what we've implanted in their minds that takes root that allows them to then in a sense, act out whatever the fear is. So I don't know that I can give you, I, I, I mean, I know I cannot give you a definitive answer on that. I want to mention, though, that the word right also has R-I-G-H-T, as in correct. Yeah. And then there's the right and the left. I mean, there's so many layers of meanings, and I don't know how much sorting the you know, the subliminal consciousness does of all that, I think they may impact us. So what's your take on it all? To be honest, I thought you would say, yes, they absolutely can will things into existence. But I'm actually glad that you said you don't know, because I don't know either. I've always thought that thoughts create reality. I, I never really thought about words creating reality. But I, th I think that it's probably similar. I mean, if words that come out of my mouth are thoughts, then why wouldn't my words be just as powerful as my thoughts? Well, we know that words are, are their thought forms. They contain whole concepts in them. You can have a whole paragraph in several syllables, which I find so fun and so fascinating. I also look at the fact that the word think and the word thing are one letter apart. So I believe that that our language shapes our consciousness and our consciousness um, speaking the word shapes our experience. 
Well, I also know that it's possible to be in a place in consciousness where where our desires are manifesting um, beyond words. It didn't take an invocation or a spell. Well, and, and science of mind, the prayers, it's like moving oneself into a state of consciousness where we're, what we're speaking, uh, we know energetically is reality, even if it is not yet a manifested reality. So the affirmative prayers done in, in, um, in science of mind, it's like so much is heart and, and thought and feeling level as well as words. You know, you just made me think of something. You mentioned the word curse a few minutes ago. And then I yes. immediately thought of cursive writing, which ties into the, you know, we were talking about rights and writing and things like that. That's an interesting, I don't have a question here. It's just a thought I'm having. I'm just blurting it out. But cursive writing, would that be a... That's a, a really interesting pun, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I just, I don't have anything to say. I don't have a question for you about it. It's just, it's just interesting. Cursive writing. Yeah. So would that be a negative thing then, perhaps? Well, I mean, it's like one could, <laughs> one could speculate a lot and it's it's fascinating and if we're thinking of words as spells then cursive writing except it's also now it seems to be uh disappearing from schools and yet they find that it helps with the wiring of the brain so who knows but maybe somebody does and it's just but what you've demonstrated is just how much fun it is to look at words someone who discovered my work a fellow named Jeremy Rumble he pointed out that the word forgetfulness is forgetfulness. And we all experience forgetting fullness. And in my book, uh, my unpublished book, we do come with instructions. I have um, on one of the pages, it says, most of us suffer from the crippling disease of I amnesia, the temporary loss of infinitely long term memory. And that's where forgetfulness comes in. So again, if we are gods, if we are sparks of the divine, we are with omnificent, all creative power. And if the word created the world, and there's all sorts of quotes that I have on my website, my Word Magic Global website about politics corrupts language and language once corrupted has corrupting real world influence. And Orwell himself also said that we can start, you know, we can make changes by starting at the verbal end. And once I, I came to the conclusion that language is software and that we can upgrade it, then I, I learned that Confucius, when asked what he would do first if given charge of the administration of a country, said that the first thing he would do would be to correct language. And he said, if language is not correct, then what is said is not what is meant. And if if what is said is not what is meant, then what needs to get done remains undone. And if this remains undone, arts and morals deteriorate, justice goes astray, and people stand around in hopeless confusion. So that goes back to using the word for the world's recreation. We can make a difference. We are speakers of the word with omnificent powers, and we have a potential that is aching within us to be actualized, especially at this time. We are we outnumber the whoever whatever the force is of destruction on the planet, um, whatever we want to call it, we outnumber them. And as we awaken in greater and greater numbers and use use language more consciously, we have the potential together to really speak a new world into existence. And I have a quote here from Rumi that says, speak a new language so the world will be a new world. And Thomas Jefferson said, new conditions require new words and uh, for old things. And, and uh, there's some beautiful quotes on my page that people will enjoy. So, 
So that's that's what this is all about. And and the Georgia Guidestones, uh, are you a little familiar with them? Yeah, actually, I uh, posted an episode a few weeks ago where I talked to a guy who had visited them and had written a couple blogs about his trip there. So I'm quite familiar with what they are and what they say, yeah. Well, do you remember that the third principle on it is to create a living new language that unites humanity. Yeah. I have an article on the language of the birds, which is all about, I mean, it's if, if people would search for the language of the birds and my name, you'll find it. It's, it's an ancient concept of a language that puts us in harmony with nature. And that's what word magic is about and when I was I mean for years I have felt like an elemental being from the nature kingdom who was exiled from nature till I could help humans harmonize their speech with with natural harmonies and I wrote for my fairyography I wrote a piece called open heart synchrony I don't have it online yet but when I was writing it I thought I was really gilding the lily uh, with the prospects that I was envisioning of what would happen if our words were as resonant and harmonious as bird songs and cricket choirs. And there's a line in there that says, if our words so melt the heart, they start the milk of human kindness flowing so that every time we speak our mind, we set another flower growing. Then I believe before our very eyes, we human beings like butterflies will fully metamorphosize. And what I was going to say a while back about the earth-heart connection is, to me, that makes it obvious that the antidote, the first and foremost antidote to global warming of the earth is a global warming of the heart. Because unless enough people care, there's nothing where you're going to do that makes a difference. And I feel that the evolutionary leap that we're all meant to be taking at this time in the history of this species on this planet is from humankind to human kindness. And one of the words in that, um, in that TEDx talk, uh, one of my favorites is eudemonism, which sounds marvelously demonic, but it actually means the pleasure that comes from doing the right thing. So... Uh, a word that I invented to uh, explain that that the pleasure principle is the operative energy of the universe. Freud had it right. He just left it at the lower chakras. But as we elevate our energy, the pleasure we get through intercourse with others of a kind kind is exquisite and transcendent. So my funny made up word for that is meta-transensuous, suprasexual parahedonism. Wow. Ex it's like a Mary Poppins word. Less. What'd you say? <laughs> I said that's like a Mary Poppins word. Yeah, it is. Well, you know, supercalifragilistic. I mean, this is fun. Yeah. People love playing with words, and that's what I hope to inspire in people is more pleasure in playing with the promise of extraordinary discoveries that can open your mind, raise your consciousness, and help you become more of a creator on the planet. So one of the first things I heard you say when I really started to research your work in one of your YouTube videos was that poetry can be alchemy or can be a form of alchemy. And I was wondering, you know, I've talked about alchemy with other guests on this podcast, both in a material sense, you know, turning lead into gold and then in a spiritual sense as well. And I suspect your statement lends itself more to the spiritual sense, but maybe you could explain a little bit what you mean by poetry can be a form of alchemy. The poem you're referring to, which is on YouTube, I believe it's called Abra Palabra. And the phrase uh, turning base metal from lead to gold, if you look at the word metal, actually metal has four, four different meanings in it, at least four maybe five. But in any case, M-E-T-T-L-E -E is a quality of mind. So poetry can turn a base quality of mind from lead, like a sheep, to gold impelled from within. 
So that's kind of what I mean. And also just to say that was a, a, a channeled piece. So something I recognized as true as it was coming through me. Absolutely. I really enjoyed that poem. Thank that, you. Now, you're welcome. Now, someone who is not an all-chemical poet is Donald Trump. Uh-huh. And you actually shared a story with me that ran in the New York Times recently about Trump's degradation of language. And I don't think it's a secret that our language in general has degraded quite a lot the past couple of decades, you know? Yes. So to me, his use of language is simply a, a reflection of American culture and society at large. We don't use words properly anymore we speak in heavy slang and we text in abbreviations and acronyms so I'm just wondering from your perspective how important is it that we learn how to communicate properly again how important well i have a series of quotes about that um it's one by the i think he's a nobel prize winning poet octavio paz who says when a society becomes corrupt what first grows gangrenous is language social criticism therefore begins with grammar and the reestablishment of meanings and an actor dennis weaver who said Changing mass consciousness is an individual responsibility, and we're making the world out of language and story all the time. Therefore, the world is changing. Realists, of course, challenge this, but to be a realist often means simply settling for one of the meaner fictions of our time. Whoever controls the images, the language controls the world, Allen Ginsberg. Ken Burns said it's the most powerful force, I believe, on earth, the English language. Someone else says that the deterioration of language is the deterioration, oh, the decline of language is the decline of the life of the people who use it. So we may feel like victims of um, insane, well, here's a good word for our time, cacistocracy. That's K A K I S. T-O-C-R-A-C-Y. It's what we're living in, and it's ruled by the worst elements in society. So this is our moment, really, because... We can do all of these things, like all the environmental improvements, everything that, uh, that Trump is busy rolling back. When we try to make changes on the outside, they don't last. And the source of the pollution in our world is uh, pollution of the global sea of consciousness from which all our decisions emanate. And it's our worldview shaped by our sh the stories we tell ourselves about who we are and why we're here and how the language affects our perception of all that that causes us to uproot the very ground of our being. So becoming conscious of the word and becoming greater masters of it just by playing with words. As I said, they will reveal their contents to you as you play with them and make brilliant discoveries. So I have a vision for what I call Word Magic's Literary Lotto, where people are inspired to listen to the still small voice within and ask for new words and phrases and metaphors and then send them in with a dollar. And uh, to a group of people who help them choose the best of them and use them on T-shirts and bumper stickers and honor the prophet who brought this word through and phrases like random acts of kindness. And if people will go to my second most popular YouTube, which is called Taking Command of the English Language, it explains a vision for how we can start turning things around, taking back the power of the word and our own consciousness, which has been under the spell of this language, which was manipulated to begin with, and start becoming greater creators and more conscious, kind speakers, we can start shifting the balance of power because a few awake people outnumber thousands and millions of sleepwalkers. Are you familiar with the concept of the trivium? 
Yes, a trivium and quadrivium. I'm only familiar in in knowing that I guess it was medieval education was so much more uh, comprehensive, deep and broad than ours. Yeah, well, you, you know, we're talking about grammar and language, and it just makes me think of the trivium, you know, with the trivium is what uh, grammar, logic and rhetoric. I think it very much ties into our entire discussion here. I was just curious if you were familiar with that concept. Oh, only in that I've I've heard it and I've looked it up. But I also heard that James Joyce said some of my puns are trivial, but others are quadrivial. Which is, <laughs> I've not heard that. That's fantastic. I that, love that quote. Yeah. And, and what I have that's comparable is um, I don't just write in metaphor, but meta five, six, seven, and eight. <laughs> That's awesome. And that that's in one of my poems that's online on YouTube called Metafortissimo. Okay. You know, yeah. it, it does seem too, I, I'm just thinking as we're talking here, it does seem that the English language was created with some real intention and purpose. Have you ever thought about where it was created and why it was created and why all these words that we have can mean all these different things and, and how it does tie back to this magical spell casting quality? I've not really researched this much, but I'm curious if you have or if you know anything about the creation of the language itself and, and what intent and purpose it actually has. So it's funny, in Dan Brown's book, The Da Vinci Code, he has a statement in there about how English was considered la lingua pura because it was out of the reach of the papacy's manipulation, propaganda-making machine. A lot of times people ask me, who did this to us? And I have, have a different perspective. I think that probably some of it was purposefully done but I think a lot of it just occurs and just in the same way that sonar can create visual images when you have all of these words and the consciousness that was dominant when the molten streams of consciousness from various cultures was flowing into one language. The dominant consciousness was uh, the church, as I said earlier. So in my vision statement, I'll just read this little chunk of it. It says, over the course of my life, I have cultivated a heightened sensitivity to how the total normality of insanity in society is echoed, reflected, and reinforced by the English language, which inadvertently yet unavoidably propagates the antiquated and manipulated vision of reality promulgated by the church as an instrument of mind control at a time when people had to surrender their minds if they wanted to keep their heads about them quite literally. So I I think the church's uh, manipulated vision of reality echoes in the language and the secret spells of the English language is like a really fast way to get a glimpse of what I mean by that and how it all happens. I mean, I'm sure it's, it's like a, an echo chamber and a hall of mirrors. It's complex and, and everything is reflecting on everything else and, can I give you a definitive answer? Heck no. And <laughs> But it sure is fun to explore. And it did lead me to recognize that we have power with our words and can use them to make a powerful, positive difference in the world. Last question for you, Laurel. I've explored a lot of filthy words, swear words, curse words, however you want to label them. I swear a lot. I've read that people who do swear a lot are more intelligent, but sometimes I wonder if that just doesn't make me sound fucking stupid. See what I did there? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just curious, you know, just from your perspective, what's your take on swear words? What do they really mean and, and how much power do they have? I haven't explored that. I've just found that the more I play with words, the less prone I am to use words that are are evoking images that are less than beautiful. Okay. So I shouldn't say the F word a lot then. Well, I you, I say it occasionally. It's very satisfying, especially when used <laughs> sparingly. Sure. But I'm willing to let that go too. Gosh, I had a wonderful quote 
from Peter Farb about that, about taboo words, trying to prevent children from using them. And that very process makes them all the more interesting. So yeah. to take taboos off. So I, I don't have a strong opinion or objection to them. I just love beauty. And so that's what guides my choice of words. Well, this has been a be you too full conversation. I've really enjoyed speaking with you today. So could you remind people where they can keep up with your work? I have to say that I have not been very active on social media, but my uh, words, uh, I have two websites. If you go to Laurel Erica, L-A-U-R-E-L, A-I-R-I-C-A dot com. That's my writing editing website. It's full of interesting things. And I believe the second button there is Word Magic Global. You could also just go directly to Word Magic Global. I have two books for sale. Actually, really only one. The first one I, I did is about the words in common between marriage and horses. It's a coffee table book. You can go directly to Horsing Around with Words. There's only about 20 left. Um, so I sell them for $50. I, I found someone selling it uh, in Australia for more than that. But the, the work that is an anthology of my poetry, um, just a, a selection of poems that collectively reveal my perspective that is easily obtained for $20. It has a CD and it's $20 plus postage. And you'll find both those books on my Word Magic Global website. I am going to be working with some people who will help me get a little more adept at promotion of my work because I'd like more people to get to share and enjoy it and to start using the word for the world's recreation. Absolutely. And hopefully some people will check out your work a little further after hearing you talk here today. Well, thank you. I have so enjoyed our conversation. You're a really lovely, fun interviewer, very beautiful fellow. And I thank you so very much. Wow. That was very sweet of you. You didn't have to say that. But thank you for the kind words. And thank you for your time as well. Well, thank you, and send me your address, and I'll get around to sending you a copy of that book and CD, my anthology. And, and I learned a while back that uh, the original meaning of anthology was a collection of flowers. Really? Okay. So this is my garden of verses. This has been the most enjoyable interview I've done. I feel a real love for you and a real gratitude toward you. Thank you so much. No, no problem. I'd love to have you back anytime. We can talk about anything. Oh, bless you. Thank you. Much love. Ooh, we. How about that? My thanks again to Laurel Erica. Check out laurelerica.com if you're craving more of that word magic. Link is in the show notes. There are some great lessons in here to take with us as we continue to recreate and transmutate our own realities, particularly the notion that we need to choose our words wisely. I'm guilty of being an asshole and hurting people with my words. I think that's just part of being human. I don't think many of us have grasped just how powerful our words are. But if you can summon spirits merely by chanting a few random noises, you can certainly pass off a vibe or two to everyone you speak to with those same sounds. That's not something you're taught in your formative years when you're learning about language and how it's structured, but goddamn, our words powerful. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can fucking kill me. Best believe that. So please do be careful with how you choose to speak. I'm trying to be more cognizant of my own word choice, and it is hard because we all have that hubris, that egotistical emotional energy that gets in our own way, and I'm a Scorpio beyond that, so I do suffer from that forked tongue fuck up more often than most. I may float like a butterfly with my meditative and yogic practices, but I can still sting like a motherfucking son of a bee when I want to. Maybe I should cut down on my swearing too while I'm at it. Anyway, I do hope you enjoyed the chat. If you did, please do consider supporting the show. We're accepting PayPal donations at oculturepodcast.com slash support. You can offer up a one-time donation in an amount of your choosing, or you can subscribe to the show monthly by choosing one of our seven levels of support. We're also accepting Bitcoin if you're into that sort of thing. 
Although I do think I may transition that support system from PayPal to Patreon in the near future because I can offer patrons of the show exclusive bonus content which I'd love to do and which I want to do. And honestly, I chose the PayPal route to start with because it was easier and took less time than Patreon. But choosing the easier of two paths is never the right choice. So if you want to hold off a bit on donating, if you're not yet sold on the show or need some time to scrounge around some loose change, that's cool. I'd recommend waiting for the launch of the Patreon campaign anyway. But hey, any little bit you can offer until then does help me. Podcasting is free for you to listen to, but it's not free for me to produce. And I'd love to keep doing it because I love the medium. I love talking to the guests and sharing the conversations with you. I love coming up with new ideas to work on and share with you, which I'm in the process of doing right now. And I love each and every one of you guys. I love the listeners I've been able to meet and interact with so far. And whether you choose to support this show or not, my virtual door is always open to you at oculturepodcast at gmail.com. Feel free to drop me a line about anything and you can also slide into my dms too we're on twitter at oculturepod and on instagram at oculture underscore podcast and you can also check us out on facebook at facebook.com slash oculturepodcast but anyway that's enough plugs that does it for me you've just been initiated into oculture i am ryan peverly reminding you to love yourself think for yourself and question authority Please rewind this cassette.